Thank you, and thank you for having me here to speak. Um, so what I want to do today is talk a little bit about what we know about climate change on Earth, both using observations to show how we've gotten to where we are now, as well as using broader science to understand why, where we might go in the future and how we might respond to climate change. So just to start, one of the primary ways that NASA studies the Earth is through our fleet. We have more than two dozen satellites and instruments in orbit, including several on the International Space Station, that are continually monitoring the planet. Most of these satellites are global in scope, so we can see not just where we live, but we can see anywhere around the world. And all of this information is publicly available, so people can look at what's happening in their communities. We've been observing the, the planet for decades, so we can see both the state of it today as well as how it's changed over time. We're able to see things like vegetation, changes in the mass of ice sheets, carbon dioxide, clouds and precipitation, and much more. We're also continuing to innovate and add to our observations. So this past December, we launched a satellite called SWAT, or Surface Water and Ocean Topography, that'll give us the first global survey of water running through rivers and lakes. And we use water as we grow crops and produce energy, and this satellite will give us more information about how much water we have and how that changes over time. It'll also pro provide more information about oceans and ocean circulation. We use um, oceans that absorb a lot of carbon and heat and have a really important role in climate change, and SWAT will improve our understanding of those. We do, many of these missions are NASA missions, but a lot of them are also done in partnership um, with other space agencies, either within other agencies in the US or other international space agencies. So just as an example, SWAT, um, the satellite I just mentioned, is in partnership with CNES with contributions from the UK and Canadian Space Agency. And that international partnership is really important both in innovation as well as in sharing what we do globally. So how is the planet changing? So I'm going to start just with um, temperatures and talking a little bit about climate change um, and what we know about this. This is an animation based on surface temperature observations, though if you look at a satellite record, you'll see similar trends for overlapping years. Um, it, the animation starts in the late 1800s, and it's going to work its way through present day. And what we can see is the planet is warming. Uh, 2022 was tied for the fifth warmest on record, and collectively the last nine years have been the warmest since modern record keeping began. Uh, temperatures are about 1.1 degrees Celsius above the late 19th century average, but we're seeing more warming over land than over ocean, and more in higher latitudes than lower latitudes. It's not just temperatures that are changing, we're seeing other impacts and changes in the Earth system that, that affect people and ecosystems all around the world. And I'm going to provide some specific examples of that um, going forward in my talk. But I did just want to say, you know, this is showing you past temperatures. We also know that with continued emissions, temperatures will continue to rise. So in the latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, um, or IPCC report, that came out in March, um, it stated that the best estimate of reaching 1.5 degrees Celsius is in the near term. It is important to note that an individual year exceeding 1.5 degrees does not mean that we've exceeded that warming level overall. But the IPCC says that by 2030, um, there's a 40 to 60 percent chance that any individual year will be above 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, so we're continuing to see this warming in the future. We know from science what's driving warming. Here we go. Um, so this is an animation of, gar um, of carbon dioxide concentrations from the Orbital Carbon Observatory 2, um, a NASA satellite that observes global carbon dioxide emissions. And so what we know from science is that it's unequivocal that climate change, uh, that human, climate change is caused by human activity, um, principally um, greenhouse gas emissions. And so this is showing carbon dioxide concentrations. And if you look at this, time, this over time, what you'll see is carbon dioxide concentrations are rising. This is from a satellite record. If you look at the longer surface surface records, you'll see that change over time. And that is driving a lot of the warming that we're seeing now. If you watch this animation, I'll try to play it again, um, you'll also see a seasonal variation. So if you look at this, it's animating through months, you'll see lower carbon dioxide concentrations in northern hemisphere summer um, than in northern hemisphere winter. And that has to do with the way plants respond. Um, so as plants grow, they're taking more carbon dioxide out. And by having a globally gridded um, data, um, data set on carbon dioxide, we can help scientists better understand the carbon cycle, and so understand the role of plants. So as we emit carbon dioxide through burning of fossil fuels or through land use change, 
Some of that goes into the atmosphere, but some of it's absorbed by land and ocean. And having this globally gridded data set helps us understand those processes so we can better predict them in the future. We can also use a data set like this to understand emissions. Um, so this is taking that um, satellite observations, which were in concentration, combining with other sources of data, and now we can look at emissions around the world by different countries. And so this is looking at um, annual emissions, or average annual emissions between 2015 and 2020 for fossil fuel carbon dioxide only. Um, and the height of each um, bar is giving you a sense of the, the level of emissions. And so you can see where those emissions are happening. This is just a one year, uh, uh, one average snapshot, so annual emissions, but you can look at this kind of information over time and track progress in carbon dioxide emissions. And if you look at that, what you'll find is some countries have emissions that are continuing to rise, while some countries actually have emissions that are declining. Globally, emissions are still continuing to rise, and what we know from science is as long as carbon dioxide con uh, emissions are positive, warming from carbon dioxide will continue. Or put differently, if we want to limit warming, we need to reach net zero carbon dioxide. It is also possible to reduce warming by having net negative carbon dioxide. So taking more um, carbon out of the atmosphere than we put in, you could actually reduce temperatures again. But we can take this satellite information about carbon dioxide concentrations, combine it with other information sources, and give you an estimate of emissions around the world. Carbon dioxide is not the only greenhouse gas. So if you were around yesterday, there was a lot of conversation around methane. Um, this particular thing, um, animation is a visualization of methane concentrations. It is a modeled product, so it's from a model um, run out of the Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, but what we know, so first of all, methane has contributed to warming up until now. So warming to date, about 0.8 degrees Celsius is from carbon dioxide, about 0.5 is attributed to methane. But methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. Depending on the time scale, so in 20 years, it's about 80 times as the warming potential of carbon dioxide. On 100 years, it's about 25 times. Um, there are different sources of methane. So methane, a lot of the methane sources come from agriculture, things like livestock and rice paddies. There's also sources from energy production, so oil and gas or coal mines. Um, and different countries have different sources. And so this animation is showing global uh, methane around the world for a, a few year time slot. Um, so you can see where those sources are. The bright red, the more methane. We can also look at methane super emitters. So this is an image of the Southwest US. Um, it is from EMIT, an instrument that was installed on the International Space Station about a year ago. Um, and EMIT was actually designed to study mineral dust. Um, so mineral dust are these fine particles that are uh, kicked up from things like desert and agriculture. And the, um, the color of the mineral dust will dictate whether it absorbs or reflects sunlight. And so EMIT was designed to give us more observations of that so that we better understand warming from mineral dust. But the science team at JPL realized that we can also look at methane from that. And so they have been able to put out these products that show us where there are methane super emitters. And by overlaying with other data sets, they can identify some of the sources of those methane plumes. And so it's a really interesting innovation um, in how we use an existing instrument to measure something different. So, that was the t uh, greenhouse gases. So we know greenhouse gases are rising. They've driven the warming we see to date. We also know that how much more warming we experience in the future depends on future emissions. So now I want to talk a little bit about the impacts of the warming. So not just temperatures are rising. I said that there were other impacts on the Earth system. So let's give a little bit of a, an overview of what those, some of those impacts are. And I want to start with um, ice sheets. Um, so this is an animation of uh, Greenland and Antarctic ice mass. And you, what you'll see is the change in the mass of ice sheets over time. This is from a set of satellites, GRACE and GRACE follow-on. Um, they're in partnership with DLR and NASA, and they've been observing um, changes in ice sheet mass for more than 20 years. So we have more than 20 years of information on this. And so what we can see is the total change in ice mass, which is what you see in that line chart at the bottom, you can also see the spatial res um, change. So those red areas are places where we're losing ice. There is some blue where we're gaining ice. And by able, being able to do this spatially explicit, we can better understand ice sheet dynamics and help scientists better understand the processes that lead to changes in massive ice sheet and better predict that in the future. 
When we think about the future, ice sheets are one of these um, impacts that scientists call irreversible. So that means even if we were to bring warming down, we wouldn't be able to reverse I the loss of ice sheet mass on centuries to millennia time scale. Um, the changes in ice sheet mass have more to do with temperature through time than they do with current temperatures. Um, so it is an irreversible loss. And they do have impacts. So one of the main you know, changes that happen with ice sheet mass is sea level rise. So as ice sheets melt, that water runs into the ocean and increases the volume of water in the ocean. And with more water in the ocean, we see sea levels rise. We're also, with the increased heat um, on Earth, we're seeing changes in thermal, it's called thermal expansion, where the oceans are taking up more space. So we have more water in the ocean, and they take up more space, and that has led to changes in sea level. Um, and so this graph on the top is showing in global mean sea level. The chart starts in uh, around 19, in, in the early 90s because that's when our satellites that measure this started. So we have about 30 years worth of information using satellite altimetry to look at total sea level. And we can combine that type of information showing you total sea level rise with the information from the ice sheet loss that I just mentioned from GRACE and get a, a better sense of the contributors to um, sea level rise. So you might say, well, what does global mean sea level of 100 millimeters rise mean? What does that mean for me? Um, and I think that's a very common question. When you're actually thinking about these impacts, it's not global changes that people relate to. It's what's happening where I live. And it's not just what's happened until now, but it's also what might happen in the future and how can I use that information to plan. Um, so NASA's sea level change team has provided information like that. So we have a tool, if you go into Na the web, um, web and look for NASA sea level rise, you'll find this. We have a tool that shows you a map of the world, and you can click on points along the coast, and it'll tell you how much sea level has risen in that particular location, and what the contributions are from different factors, like ice sheet uh, mass loss and thermal expansion, or what's called vertical land movement, where the, the land moves up or down. And so you can look at how much sea level has risen and in your coastal um, area. We've also partnered with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to look at projections of sea level into the future. So in a very similar tool on the same website, you can click on that coastal city anywhere in the world, and it'll show you projections of sea level into the future. And that information is really important for planning. Um, and what you'll see when you look at that, though, is how much more sea level we might experience depends on the scenario. So future warming depends on future emissions. Future sea level depends on future warming. Um, so there's a variety of possible futures for sea level in that tool. So that was sea level. There's some other changes in the water cycle that matter for people and ecosystems around the world. And so this is an animation showing you extreme wet and extreme dry conditions around the world. This is also using GRACE data. So GRACE, the satellite that measured changes in massive ice sheet, can also measure changes in terrestrial water storage and use that to get a sense of where there are floods or droughts. Um, and what this is showing you, the red are the dry conditions, the blue are the wet. If you look at the bottom right, the total intensity, that is an index that's capturing this, the, the severity, extent, and duration of these extreme events. And what we're seeing is that with warming, we're seeing more of these extreme wet and extreme dry events. And what we know from science is that in the future, with future warming, we'll see more heavy precipitation events, and in some regions, more droughts. So GRACE isn't the only way that we can look at droughts. Um, so first of all, um, when you think about droughts, it impacts um, lots of different processes and ecosystems around the world. It's a big impact on agriculture. So farmers need to know what are the, the, the soil conditions, how much water do their plants need, and floods and droughts can greatly influence their yields. Droughts also have an influence on wildfires. So fire weather depends on how hot, dry, and windy it is. And so you can see understanding um, water and, and, and droughts and, and heavy precipitation events are really important for understanding those. The animation on the left here is from a different satellite called SMAP that's showing us soil moisture. And so that's really important for farmers and for understanding fire to understand how dry is the soil where you are. We have other satellites that can provide other information that's relevant to agriculture and farmers. So Landsat can tell us about vegetation health. GRACE can also give us information about groundwater storage, and farmers use groundwater for irrigation. So understanding how that changes over time and what's available is really important for planning. 
We have developed a tool called OpenET that's, de that's designed to help farmers understand water and plan their water management on their fields. It's targeting the Western US, um, but there is a, it's, it's open, it's free data, but it's, it's designed to help people understand water management so they can better plan. When do I need to irrigate? How much to irrigate? Based on the conditions where you are. So moving from um, to another uh, extremes, um, hurricanes I want to talk about. This animation, I'm going to describe what it is at the beginning and then I'll talk about hurricanes and climate more in general. This is an animation of the 2021 hurricane season in the Atlantic. Um, there were a lot of storms that year, it was a very active hurricane year, and what the animation is showing you is precipitation as well as the storm tracks for it. And so they're just going to animate their way through, um, but what I want to talk about is how hurricanes are linked to climate. So what we know, um, um, from observations is that we are seeing more strong storms. Um, so a higher proportion of the storms we're seeing are strong storms due to climate. There's also some evidence of shifts in, um, in hurricane tracks. Um, so hurricanes like warm water, and so it, you know, as the water's warm, you may see some shifts in tracks more northward. There's some evidence of that. We also know from some of the physical science understanding is that we'll see more heavy precipitation in the storms we see. And as we look into the future with climate change, the expectation is that we'll see a higher proportion of, of, uh, of category three through five um, hurricanes going forward because of climate change. Um, and these have really devastating consequences on communities in terms of flooding, infrastructure, and even in some places a human toll um, on, on um, uh, ecosystems and people. So moving from that, I want to continue on land, um, and this is the, the last of the impacts before I move towards what we can do. Um, so land is really interesting in terms of climate in that it both influences climate, but it's also influenced by climate. This is an animation from Landsat. So Landsat was a series of satellites developed in partnership with the U, um, between NASA and the US Geological Survey that show you land, and this is a false color image, but you can look at, from this, you can see where there are trees, where there's crops, where there's urban areas. We have more than 50 years of of Landsat. So the first Landsat was in 1972, and so we have 50 years of this information. And this is showing you Las Vegas over 50 years, and what you can see is urban areas are expanding. If you look around the world, that's a general trend we see. Our cities are getting bigger. Some parts of the world, we're seeing things like declines in forest area. We're also seeing shrinking of lakes in parts of the world. Well, as the land surface changes, its reflectivity changes. So the amount of sunlight reflected, and that has influence on climate. Also, as the land use changes, we'll see differences in carbon storage. So trees store more carbon than bare ground. And if we're changing the land surface, we're changing the amount of carbon land is storing. And that has an impact on how much carbon remains in the atmosphere and how much more we warm. Um, and Landsat can give us a lot of information about that. And since we have 50 years of global Landsat data, we can look at that anywhere in the world. This is just an example from Las Vegas, um, but we have data sets like this for all over. So that's how climate is, you know, how much climate's what climate is changing and how it's impacting us. The question I always get asked is what can we do? So I wanna talk a little bit about what NASA's doing um, for climate. So we are a science and technology agency. So I've talked a little bit about science, I'll come back to science, but I wanna talk about technology. One of the things we do is develop technologies that can help people mitigate and adapt to climate change. And the first one I'm gonna talk about is actually aeronautics. Um, so the first A in NASA is aeronautics. We have a team that works with the aviation industry and has for decades to reduce the amount of energy use and emissions associated with flying. So when you're in your next flight, um, probably later this week, if you look out at the end of the wing, you'll see the wing curves up. That reduces drag, which means less energy used and less emissions, and that comes from NASA research. And we're continuing to do that kind of research on aircraft design, on airport operations, and on new technologies to make flying more efficient. Um, so just a couple more examples on airport operations. They're looking at how to more efficiently move aircraft around an airport, and some of those have mean us spending less time waiting on the tarmac, which means less time spending waiting on the tarmac, but also less energy used and less emissions. We're also working on developing an electric airplane, um, so new technologies that can make uh, flying use less emissions. The aeronautics team doesn't just work in the mitigation space, they're also working to help us understand how to respond to some of the impacts um, that we're facing. So I didn't talk a lot about wildfire, but one of the areas that they're working in is in wildfire. We have centers out in California that are experiencing wildfire regularly and trying to think about how we can help. And so we've had a number of workshops with the fire communities to understand what are the challenges they're facing and how can NASA technology help. 
One of the things we've learned is that a lot of, you know, putting out fires, we do that from aircraft um, in, in parts of the U.S., and, but those aircraft can only fly in what's called visible flight conditions. They can only fly when they can see, which means they can't put out, they can't do these flights at night, and they can't do it when it's smoky. Um, and so one of the things we're thinking about is can we use our technology, like uncrewed air aircraft systems, to help meet those needs? And we, the aeronautics team has been working with the earth science team to look at how can we better monitor, predict, and respond to wildfire. So how can we use the technology and what we know um, to help in, in response? It's not just aeronautics where we develop technologies. Living, working, and exploring space forces us to think about sustainability and how we use resources, and that has input, um, impacts that we can use here on Earth. So I'll just mention a few. The first is on crops. Um, we grow crops in space. Um, so we are living and working at the International Space Station, and the, the astronauts there grow crops. Um, and some of the research we've done to grow crops on space is used here on Earth. So we've done research into LED lighting that's used in indoor agriculture facilities. We've done research on fertilizer that uses less, um, less fertilizer. It directs the nutrients to plant roots at the rates they can use it, which means less fertilizer needs and also less running into rivers and lakes. We're also doing, oh, we do a lot of prizes and challenges to spur innovation in the community. We have a deep space food challenge that's trying to um, incentivize people to think about how to produce food with lower inputs. The Canadian Space Agency is running a parallel challenge. For, uh, for space exploration, that means bringing less with you. Here on Earth, that means using less. Um, we have a, another challenge uh, called Watts on the Moon um, that's looking at energy re um, reliability and energy storage on the moon, but that also means you know, some of those technologies could mean better energy reliability and energy storage here on Earth. So continue to think about how our technologies that we use for space and space exploration can be used here on Earth. The last couple things I want to think about is how we make data more accessible and how we get the information we have out to people. So we know a lot about the planet. We've been studying it for decades. We are scientists, we are engineers, we are experts. There are people everywhere that are making decisions that are influenced by climate change. How do we help them? And so we have an open source science initiative at NASA. This is really broader than earth science, but it's important for earth science. Um, 2023 is the year of open science. And this is about going beyond just making data publicly available. All of our data is publicly available, but we need to think about how to make it accessible and easier to use so people around the world have what they need when they need it. Um, and some of that involves more trainings, moving data to the cloud, um, thinking about data data formats, um, and, and, and just trying to include, increase participation in our science so that the uh, science has broader reach. We have a specific effort focused on Earth and climate called the Earth Information Center. This is a concept announced by the administrator in late 2021, and it is opening this summer. Um, and the Earth Information Center is really about helping people understand how cl um, climate and Earth system changes are impacting what's happening where they live and what they experience, as well as providing information to help them respond to those decisions. Uh, there are two parts of it. There's a physical space and a virtual space. And in the physical space, we'll be showing visualizations and telling stories about, um, about the Earth. And I don't know if anyone went to the science communication panel on Tuesday. They talked about the power of visualizations, and that's something that really resonates with us. We work with a lot of science communicators and really using these visualizations to inspire, to inform, and to engage. So using the visualization to draw people in, let them know what we know about what's happening where they live, and then leave them with something that they can take home. Um, and so the virtual space will be that take-home portion. So you can go to that, you can watch the stories, you can see what we have, but you can also access the tools and resources that actually inform decisions. And we are organizing this around topics. So I think in missions, if you give me an acronym, I can tell you what mission it is, who the partners were, how long it's flown. That's not the way the general public thinks. They think about, I am interested in agriculture. I am interested in sea level rise. And so we're organizing it around that. So you, all you need to know is I'm interested in agriculture, and we can tell you what data we have. We're working with our other federal partners um, to bring together other data and other resources so it's not just NASA, but the, the full power of what we know. Um, and that will be opening in June. So I will just end with, you know, part of what we are doing is, is, is helping understand climate change and understand how the Earth system has changed. We are innovating both in terms of new understanding as well as in new technologies. And a big part of what we do is share everything we have with everyone around the world so that what we know can benefit all of humanity. And with that, I will turn it for, I think someone's going to help me with questions.
So we do have a couple of questions. The first one, how does NASA transfer these innovative technologies to private sector and other agencies for operational exploitation? So we have a very active tech transfer program that works towards licensing the technologies so that people can use them. And there are actually NASA technologies everywhere you go. You just may not know it. So your cell phone camera comes from NASA technology. Um, and we have, if you're interested in learning specific examples um, and more about how we do it, we have a magazine we put out every year called Spinoffs. It's on the web. Um, but they also have a portal where you can look up if you want to know about you know, different types of technologies and how that have gotten out into the community. But it's a very active area of effort is making sure you know, that we, we get that, info, um, that technology out. And the last question, can we track the groundwater recharge pathways and potential disruptions as well as storage and soil moisture? So we have different satellites that track different parts of that. So GRACE can give us, um, we can use GRACE to understand changes in groundwater. We can use SMAP, um, the one I showed, to look at soil moisture. We have GPM that can show us precipitation. And we have, you know, different um, satellites talk about different aspects of the water um, cycle. And if you were in, there was a plenary yesterday where they went through the whole history of how we monitor the water cycle from space. So we can see different parts of that. And then we can use tools like models to bring that all together and to fill in the extra parts of that. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all very much. I think we have a panel coming up next, so I will 